Philip K. Dick's novel, The Man in the High Castle, is an alternate history in which the Axis powers, and that is Nazi Germany, Imperial Japan, the Italian state, and a few other minor allies, won World War II against first the allies, or rather they weren't even really that allied at the time, the British Empire, the French, of course, and the uh, Soviet Union. The United States stayed neutral and then was later itself conquered in significant part by these. And so the entire world has been, you know, you could say divvied up, divided among these powers. Whoever could take things did. And so we have, um, you know, these three main things, uh, Nazi Germany and its legacy. It's the most powerful state in the world, followed closely by the Japanese Empire. And then we have the much weaker, uh, and it's not quite clear what's going on with them, Italian state, which has been given some of the spoils of war. And then we have a few neutral countries. Sweden gets mentioned very early on. Um, Canada appears to be neutral, part of what used to be the United States of America is also neutral as well. And so that is the setting for this. And it is, at least for us at this point, definitely an alternate history because the events are taking place several decades after the you know, conquest and division of the, the world. So the plot, the characters, and the action are occurring in portions of what used to be the United States, specifically the Pacific States of America, so the West Coast, and then what are called the Rocky Mountain States. And you know we don't actually know all that well exactly where the boundaries lie for these things. People have generated a lot of maps, but there is no official map for Philip K. Dick's book. Um, but the action in this, in a larger sense, has a world scope because what we're seeing happening as all of these, these you know, subplots are coming together is that the Nazi leadership is going to be changing hands. And the rivalry between the Nazi state and the Japanese state is, is coming to an important head. So we've got these essentially two rival you know, the, in the case of the Nazi state, totalitarian, in the case of the Japanese state, semi-totalitarian empires that are going to be clashing with each other, and then many individuals sort of figuring out their own role within this. So we should talk first about the Japanese empire, the larger co-prosperity sphere, and the Pacific states of America. And there's a few characters through the eyes of which, and thoughts of which we can learn quite a bit about this. The first is Frank Frank, formerly Frank Fink, uh, who had been born on the East Coast in New York, drafted into the Army of the United States of America. Um, he'd been sent to the West Coast. When the war ended, there he was on the Japanese side of the settlement line. There he was today, 15 Years later, we find out that on Capitulation Day, he had gone berserk, hating the Japs as he did. And you notice we're going to be using a lot of this old-fashioned racist language. It's in, in part because we're in a racist world, a world in which racism, uh, in, in the form of both of these massive empires, has essentially taken root. And, you know, the America of the time continues that as well. Anyway, Frank had buried his service weapons for the day he and his buddies arose. But uh, interestingly, uh, his mindset has changed. He you know, recalls their Mr. Amuro, who had taken over a lot of rental property in downtown San Francisco. He was a, a gouger, a slumlord. And what happened to him? Well, the Japanese trade missions had cut off his head for profiteering. And it goes on, nowadays such a violation of the harsh, rigid, but just Japanese civil law was unheard of. It was a credit to the incorruptibility of the Jap occupation officials, especially those who, who, those who had come in after the war cabinet had fallen. And uh, so, you know, what we see here 
is that it's not just brutal force ruling over everybody. Rather, it's you know very firm but fair. And we also see something interesting in this this uh, radio broadcast that Frank is listening to. Um, he uh, is talking about uh, an effort, right? And um, they're, they're thinking about Germans walking around on the moon. And then the radio goes on, co-prosperity civilization. And you notice the co-prosperity sphere is now a civilization. Must pause and consider whether in our quest to provide a balanced equity of mutual duties and responsibilities coupled with remunerations, typical jargon from the ruling hierarchy, Frank noted, we have not failed to perceive the future arena in which the affairs of man will be acted out, namely out in space. But then it goes on and says, we must consider with pride, however, our emphasis on the fundamental physical needs of peoples of all place, their sub-spiritual aspirations, which must be. And what, what are they talking about there? So sub-spiritual aspirations, basic needs of human Beings. Now, this is still a very structured racial hierarchy with Japanese at the top and uh, Chinese being treated essentially as slaves, right? Uh, white people somewhere in between. The, the Japanese not caring much about what's happened to, to black people in the Americas. Um, but there is still this extension of concern, not in a human rights way, but in a way that's influenced, you could say, by a sort of pervasive, um, you know, Confucianism, something like that, uh, thinking about taking care of everybody, feeding everybody, for example. So that's an interesting intro to this. We also find out that not only are the Japanese behind on the space exploration game, but when we look at what Mr. Tagomi, who is an incredibly important character, um, is going to bring up, it, it turns out that uh, the, the Japanese are kind of behind on a number of different matters, right? So how does this play itself out? Here we go. Um, for years, the Pacific had been trying to get basic assistance for, in the synthetics field from the Reich, the Germans. The big German chemical cartels, IG Farben in particular, had harbored their patents, had in fact created a world monopoly in plastics, especially in the development of the polyesters. By this means, Reich trade had kept an edge over Pacific trade, and in technology, the Reich was at least 10 years ahead. The interplanetary rockets leaving Festung Europa consisted mainly of heat-resistant plastics, very light in weight, so hard they survived even major meteor impact. The Pacific had nothing of this sort. Natural fibers such as wood were still being used, and of course the ubiquitous pot metals. Mr. T Tagomi cringed as he thought about it. He'd seen at trade fairs some of the advanced German work, including an all-synthetics automobile. And so this guy from Sweden, Mr. Baines, who is uh, going to be talking about new injection molds, is perhaps offering something. Of course, he turns out to be a spy, as we're going to talk about. But So what we have is a Japanese empire that is being depicted as, in many respects, uh, you know, becoming more and more humane, uh, not only in its official policy, but also in the approaches of its main characters that we see, the Japanese characters in this, but it's to some degree um, not just less powerful, but behind the Nazi German regime. So now we should look at the greater German Reich and none of the action is, well, actually just a little bit of the action at the very end is taking place in the Reich, but um, much of it is, is determined by the Reich. And the Reich is more powerful, but it's also more malignant. The Nazis have not become more humane over time. If anything, they've become a bit worse. And what we're going to see is a very interesting observation that the uh, Nazi regime and its members seem uh, to 
to not be able to keep biting off more than they can chew. Right? They, they have to go on and take more and more things. So there's this great discussion that's happening here. Now, the Nazis appear to be stronger, but perhaps are not. So um, here's, here's a discussion that's taking place as, uh, by the Japanese as the German government is transitioning by means of like something almost like a covert civil war. Um, the home islands take the view that, the Ger that Germany's scheme to reduce the populations of Europe and Northern Asia to the status of slaves, plus murdering all intellectuals, bourgeois elements, patriotic youth, and whatnot, has been an economic catastrophe. Only the formidable technological achievements of the German science and industry have saved them, miracle weapons, so to speak. It is a sleight of hand business, the non-ferrous ores man said. Mainly their uses of atomic energy have kept things together and the diversion of their circus-like rocket travel to Mars and Venus. He pointed out that for all their thrilling imports, such traffic have yielded nothing of economic worth. But they are dramatic, Mr. Tagomi said. His prognosis was gloomy, he goes on. He feels that most high-placed Nazis are refusing to face facts vis-a-vis -vis their economic plight, by doing so, they accelerate their tendency towards greater tour de force adventures, less predictability, less stability in general. The cycle of manic enthusiasm, then fear, then parte solutions of a desperate type. Well, the point he got across was that all of this tends to bring out the most irresponsible and reckless aspirants to the top. And they're talking about the German succession, but this could apply to the entire regime. Um, going back we, to, to Frank's you know, soliloquy and thinking about the uh, radio broadcast, we find some of the things that the German state has done, these great adventures, some of which have paid off, some of which have not. So, for example, and we know that this would not actually be possible in reality, it would actually lead to all sorts of problems. In this alternate history, they closed off the Mediterranean Sea. And that actually turned out, you know, okay for them. They have this project farmland and they, you know, generated a whole bunch of new places that could be farmed. Rebens, uh, Lebensraum, as, you know, uh, Hitler had called this in talking about the East. And they've also engaged in genocides in Europe and in um, Asia, and even worse in Africa. And we first hear about this in, you know, Frank's thinking about things. So here are several passages. Um, while the Germans were busy bustling enormous robot construction systems across space, the Japs were still burning off the jungles in the interior of Brazil. And he goes on thinking about how... Um, you know, back in the old quaint history book days, the Germans had missed out while the rest of Europe put the final touches on their colonial empires. They were not going to be the last this time they'd learned. Then he thought about Africa and the Nazi experiment there. And his blood stopped in his veins, hesitated at last, went on. That huge, empty ruin. And he thought, Africa, for the ghosts of dead tribes wiped out to make a land of, of what? Who knew? Perhaps even the master architects in Berlin did not know. Bunch of automatons boil, building and toiling away, building, grinding down ogres out of a paleontology ex exhibit at their task of making a cup from an enemy's skull, the whole family industriously scooping out the contents, the raw brains first to eat, and he goes on. Uh, it horrified him, this gigantic ancient cannibal near man flourishing now, ruling the world once more. We spent a million years escaping him, and now he's back, not merely as the adversary, but the master. And what do we find out about what happened in Africa? Well, Robert uh, Childen, who's much more uh, pro-Nazi in many respects, a Nazi admirer, um, is thinking about these things. And he says to himself, one had to blame the Germans for the situation. Tendency to bite off more than they could chew, 
After all, they barely managed to win the war, and then they went on to conquer the solar system while at home they passed edicts. Well, at least the idea was good. So you can see that Sheldon is actually in sympathy with this. Uh, after all, they'd been successful with the Jews and gypsies and the Bible students, and the Slavs had been rolled back 2,000 years worth to their heartland in Asia, out of Europe entirely to everybody's relief, uh, back to riding yaks and hunting with bow and arrow, uh, to those great glossy magazines printed in Munich and circulated around to all the libraries and newsstands. You could see the full-color pictures for oneself, the blue-eyed, blonde-haired Aryan settlers who now industriously tilled, culled, plowed, and so forth in the vast grain bowl of the world, the Ukraine. Those fellows certainly looked happy, and their farms and cottages were clean. You didn't see pictures of drunken, dull-witted poles anymore, slouched on sagging porches or hawking a few sickly turnips at the village market. All a thing of the past, like rutted dirt roads that once turned to slop in the rainy season, bogging down the carts. And so you can see Childen is actually quite sympathetic to this notion of, you know, the better races are now in there, right? But then he, he goes on, but Africa... They had simply let their enthusiasm get the better of them there. And you had to admire that, though more thoughtful advice would have cautioned them to perhaps let it wait a bit until, for instance, Project Farmland had been completed. There, the Nazis had shown genius. The artist in them had truly uh, emerged. We, we've already talked about that. Africa had almost been successful, but in a project of that sort, almost was an ominous word to begin to hear Rosenberg's well-known powerful pamphlet issued in 1958, the word had first shown up then, as to the final solution of the African problem, we have almost achieved our objectives, unfortunately, however. And he goes on, still it had taken 200 years to dispose of the American Aborigines, and Germany had almost done it in Africa in 15 years, so no criticism was legitimately in order. So you notice that Childen is you know, saying, well, the, the main problem with it is it wasn't completely successful. This genocide destroying almost all of the native inhabitants in Africa. Um, they are engaging in colonization of the solar system, primarily the moon and Mars, sending these rockets, also Venus, right? But notice what else Childen himself is going to say about this. Um, the flights to Mars had distracted world attention from the difficulty in Africa. So it all came back to what he had told his fellow store owners. What the Nazis have, which we lack, is nobility. Admire them for their love of work or their efficiency, but it's a dream that stirs one, right? And so this is uh, quite interesting. We have this fascination with big, big projects that are horrible in their effects and in what they, they do. We also find out that the German Greater Reich is intending an attack on the Japanese home island, which we'll talk about in much more detail later. Things are coming to a head. They've been planning for Operation Dandelion to instigate some, some fighting and uh, start essentially a new world war in which Germany will be triumphant. I do want to bring up two other passages about uh, the Reich, but they both in part also bear upon the, the remnants of the United States of America. So we get the character Joe, who is uh, going to turn out to be a, a, an assassin, but is presenting himself as just a Italian ex-soldier and truck driver. And he talks about the cultural decline of all the places that are occupied by uh, Nazi Germany. So he says, he's talking about um, music, and he says, I like Verdi and Puccini. All we get in New York is heavy German bombastic Wagner and Orff. We have to go every week to one of those corny U.S. Nazi Party dramatic spectacles at Madison Square Garden with the flags and drums and trumpets and the flickering flame, history of the Gothic tribes and other educational crap chanted instead of spoken so as to be called art. Did you ever see New York before the war? Yes, she said, trying to read. Didn't they have swell theater in those days? That's what I heard. Now it's the same as the movie industry. It's all a cartel in Berlin. In the 13 years I've been in New York, not one good new musical or play ever opened. 
And it's the same with the book business, Joe said. It's all a cartel operating out of Munich. All they do in New York is print just big printing presses. But before the war, New York was the center of the world's publishing industry, or so they say. Right? We also find an interesting conversation being had uh, between um, several different uh, minor characters uh, about um, what the camps are like where people have to serve. Uh, here we go. Um, this is... Uh, there's a lot of reflection on, on the book that we're going to talk about, but uh, Rita says that um, she had been in these, these camps. Uh, Wyndham Maston said, you know, who, who did a really good job in the USA? Albert Speer, not Rommel in the organizational tote. Speer was the best appointment the party made in North America. He got all these businesses and corporations and factories going again and on an efficient basis. And Rita said, I couldn't live in those work camps, those dorms they have back east. A girlfriend of mine, she lived there. They censored her mail. She couldn't tell me about it until she moved back out here again. They had to get up at 6.30 in the morning to band music. And then Wyndham Maston says, well, you'd get used to it. You'd have clean quarters, adequate food, recreation, medical care provided. What else do you want? Egg in your beer? And so, again, we see these interesting comparisons. Um, the Greater Reich is very powerful, in some respects efficient, in other respects quite not, uh, beset by conflicts, and a kind of you know a, a, turning into a cultural wasteland. Then we get America itself. America has been divided up into four different quadrants. We have the Rocky mountain states, this borderland between the Pacific states of America and the Nazi satellites that we're going to see referenced. And the Rocky Mountain states are a place of freedom, but also to some extent poverty. They don't have uh, much of their own militarily. They certainly can't compete against either of these. And we see uh, an interesting discussion happening early on in the Rocky Mountain states with Juliana, um, who's one of the other main characters, um, talking with, with Joe. She says, if you're not happy in the U.S., why don't you cross over permanently? I've been living in the Rockies for a long time, and it isn't so bad. I lived on the coast in San Francisco. They have the skin thing there, too. Everywhere you go, people are going to be placing you in racial hierarchies. And he, he says, lady, it's bad enough to have to spend one day or, or one night in a town like this. Live here? Christ, if I could get any other kind of job and not have to be on the road eating my meals in places like that. The older truck driver said to him, Joe, you're a snob. And then Juliana says, you know, you could live in Denver. It's nicer up there. I, and then she thinks, I know you East Americans, you like the big time, dreaming your big schemes. This is just the sticks to you, the Rockies. Nothing has happened here since before the war. Retired old people, farmers, the stupid, slow, poor, and all the smart boys have flocked east to New York, crossed the border legally or illegally, because that's where the money is, the big industrial money, the expansion. German investment has done a lot. It didn't take long for them to build the U.S. back up. And then the fry cook says something quite interesting. Buddy, I'm not a Jew lover, but I've seen some of the Jew refugees fleeing your U.S. in 49, and you can have your U.S. If there's a lot of building back there and a lot of loose, easy money, it's because they stole it from those Jews when they kicked them out of New York, that goddamn Nazi Nuremberg law. I lived in Boston when I was a kid, and I got no special use for Jews, but I never thought I'd see that Nazi racial law get passed in the U.S., even if we did lose the war. I'm surprised you aren't in the U.S. Armed Forces getting ready to invade some little South American republic as a front for the Germans. And... Um, they, they almost get into a fight there. But it, it shows you some of, the, uh, some of the, we could say, perspective of, of what's going on. We also do have uh, Nazi satellites. The United States of America has been mentioned. This is essentially the north, and it's been reindustrialized. We also hear about the south, and we find out 
that slavery of black people has been reenacted in the American South. We don't really know too much about it. Um, we also find out that Canada, in some respect, is free. Bob Hope is up there making fun of Nazi ideologues such as Goebbels. Uh, we're not sure how that's the case. It's not really explained here. And then we have the Japanese satellite states of the Pacific States of America. So there you have it. This is the setting for this wonderful alternate history novel of Philip K. Dick, The Man in the High Castle.